entitled Seven Agile and DevOps Insights I Wish I Knew Earlier. And our speaker is Hans Heckman. So, Hans has proven you can turn mild ADD, OCD, dyslexia, and other personality disorders into a successful career. He, has shared, he shares his life simplification tips at conferences throughout the U.S. and Canada and on his website, ekmanguides.com. At SunTrust Bank, he established three different centers of excellence, built successful security services delivery team, and was part of two enterprise innovation teams. Hans currently serves as a principal research director with InfoTech, the world's fastest growing information technology research and advisory company, proudly serving over 30,000 IT professionals. And with that, I hand you Hans. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you all for coming here. It's wonderful. How many people here are completely and totally satisfied with how Agile is running at their organization? <laughs> but it's Agile. It's perfect. It solves all our problems. Everything's working. How many people here have started to try and implement DevOps? Got a few people. Are you noticing that it's failing kind of similar to the way Agile failed when we first tried it? Well, through the research I've done at InfoTech, through some of our other research, and just person, my personal journey over the last 20 years, I started to realize that if I had known a few things early on, I really could have saved myself a lot of stress. And I want to save, that, save you that stress today by sharing seven of these tips on Agile and DevOps that hopefully will help you along the way. So, what went wrong? What happened? Like, why isn't Agile working? Anyone want to say why they think Agile isn't working at their organization? <coughs> yeah? Because it might not be appropriate for what you're going to be working on. OK. S uh, square block, round hole, why won't it fit? Absolutely. Other reasons? Yep. It stumbles when uh, multiple teams have to work on the same project. Ah, so we have trouble scaling. But IT, we can just have one small team working. We don't actually have to work with other teams, do we? Like, it's not all interconnected at all. OK, yeah, funny that it's not working there. Yep? Because at the higher level, the organization still thinks in terms of like fiscal year budgets and fiscal year plans. Oh. And not And telling, well, well, we don't know what we're going to be done. It doesn't really play well in the season. Yeah, just give me a huge amount of money, and I'll deliver something. But I promise it'll be what you want at the end. Yeah, but need a lot of trust in an organization for that. So we have a big problem. And as we all know, it's no longer just IT as part of our organizations. IT is becoming the foundation. So as we move along, more and more of our IT spend is tied up in IT. And more and more of that spend is tied up either directly related to software licensing or to the projects that we're developing. But we've got a huge disconnect that we found in our research across all of our member companies. And that is only 34% of surveyed end users and stakeholders actually thought that the software was both effective and important. So we're spending more and more money, and only one out of three times are we delivering important and effective software. This is a huge problem. Does it mean that we're delivering bad software? Or do we have a perception problem? Or is it both? We've got to disconnect, and we need to figure out where that's coming from. So let's take a look at Agile. If we look across the board at almost any qualitative survey, like the State of the Agile report, everyone believes Agile's better. How many people here honestly think that Waterfall is better than Agile? How many people think Agile is better than Waterfall? I saw what two hands. <laughs> Everyone else is like, this is a trap. Don't answer. <laughs> Not necessarily, but everything has its place. When we look at quantitative studies, there is almost no difference between Agile and Waterfall in terms of project success and project metrics. Which means, if this whole side of the room was going to do an Agile project, and this whole side is going to use traditional Waterfall, and I gave you both the same set of high-level requirements and high-level goals, same budget, same number of team members, same constraints, both of you would statistically finish on time 
and just as successful. Now, for the Agile enthusiasts, they're going to want to throw something at me right now because that's heresy. You never say that about Agile, that it's just as good as Waterfall. But the difference is they will deliver two different products. If we guessed the features right at the beginning of the product project, both sides will develop pretty much the same thing. But Agile's designed to continually reprioritize what's important. So if we don't really know what we're going for, this side of the room in Waterfall is going to deliver something very close to the original vision, which may mean happy stakeholders. This side could develop something totally different that may or may not be happy stakeholders, depending on how we manage it. So one of the first things we've got to realize is it feels really good, but it's not necessarily better. And when we actually break down into some of the key categories in the State of Agile report, we look at some of those high metrics around the visibility, the ability to manage priorities and change and those good things. And then we start getting into this orange zone where I start looking at predictability, quality. And then I drop down to cost reduction and software maintainability. We're at horrible results in terms of satisfactions and these are from self-reported from Agile teams. And over the last five years, we did an analysis of the state of the Agile report, and these numbers are actually getting worse. The feeling that Agile is better keeps going up or stays above the 80% range, but the actual results, the problems we're having with software delivery, are becoming more apparent as Agile, the one size fits all, isn't quite working. So here are the seven tips. Like if we were going into an exam, wouldn't it be nice if you had the answers ahead of time? Well, these are the seven tips that I'm going to cover today and break down. And as we're going along, please feel free to challenge me, ask questions. <coughs> we want to turn this into a discussion. I don't want you to just assume because it's on a slide and because I'm up here, it's right. Think about your experiences and challenge those. If we don't start thinking more objectively, we're not going to be able to sort out what's truth versus what's truthiness. So the first one is the depth of the organizational divide. And if we think about that first project that we were doing, and we had a set of design features, and we estimated what it's going to take, and we set a budget and a timeline to that, how far off do you think our final product will be before we have fully satisfied the original intended goals and outcomes? So we start off with features. We estimated what the whole project was going to take when we were finished. How far off do you think we're going to be before we actually delivered the full intended value that the stakeholders wanted? So we're going to do it as an auction. Anybody want to take a guess? Anyone want to put out a number? How much over our original estimate do we think it'll be? 10%. 10%. Do I have anyone that goes higher than 10%? 50%. Double, 20%. I heard 50%. 30%. 30, 50, you can't go lower, we're already at 50. <laughs> there's, there's, that, that project management trick, hey, my estimate is 50. Oh good, can you do it in 30? No. <laughs> 50, anyone want to go higher than 50? 50% 50 over budget. 75, anyone want to go higher? 75% over budget to get the full val intended value. On an agile project? On a, any project, any software delivery project. The amount, the difference between our original estimate of what it'll take to what we will actually end up building to achieve the intended value. We're at 75%. Going once? 150. 150. I like it. <laughs> Anyone want to go higher than 150? I think we're fired at that point, right? <laughs> well, we're about to see where our IT satisfaction comes in because it's 400%. On average, the features, the software that we intended to deliver to achieve a certain value is only one quarter of what we will end up building to achieve that full value. Now, Agile says, no problem, we just keep chipping away until we get that done. Sure, but you're still spending four times as much as you think you're going to. This is a big issue, and this is from an IEEE study. So one of the foundations here is we have this horrible chasm that we have to overcome between business and IT. How many people here work for the business? How many people work for IT? Okay. Why didn't everyone who works for IT raise their hand for they work for the business? Is your IT a separate company? 
why are we treating IT as a separate company, like this orphan child that nobody wants to take home? This is not right. And this is part of the problem. And I want to challenge you, leaving this conference, instead of saying IT versus the business, talk about business units or lines of business and IT. IT is a line of business. And here's where our whole problem starts. We have our line of business stakeholders that give you this big pot of gold. They say, here's what I want, and I want it by this date. And then they throw that over the fence, and IT catches it and goes, I know they didn't really mean to ask for that because they wanted something, but what they really need is something else. So I'm going to build them what they wanted, not what they asked for. So then I throw software over the fence, and business goes, it doesn't look like anything I wanted. What are you talking about? Yes, OK, so we're agile, and we can reprioritize, but that's not what I wanted. So then they throw it back over the fence. And then this keeps going back and forth, and we're never satisfied. We have got to fix this IT chasm to move forward. And part of that is just managing expectations. So when we're doing new development, everyone's pretty much in agreement that 100% of our effort is generally going to new features. We launch a new project, it's to get new features. But the perception when it comes to maintenance is that only 20% of the effort we do in continuous development or support or maintenance is actually enhancements. Estimate most IT, most business professionals think that 40 to 80% of the work that IT is doing in maintenance and support and operations is bug fixes, defects. But in reality, it's only 21%. So we have lines of business, stakeholders, senior leadership that believes 80% of what we're doing is fixing stuff that should have worked in the first place, and we know for a fact that it's closer to 21%. So we have a huge gap in between. So our next thing is, it's all about culture. Can anyone implement a project following Agile as a methodology? Agile's not a methodology. DevOps is not a methodology. They are mindsets. They are cultural changes. I can do Scrum. I can do Kanban, I can do scaled Agile. We will eventually have DevOps frameworks. We're starting to see those pop up, which are methodologies based on that mindset. But I don't do Agile projects. Agile is a mindset that could be done in a waterfall or a Scrum or a Kanban environment. And rather than go through the whole manifesto, I want you to focus on just four key things, four key parts of that. First. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. In essence, what we're saying is, if you're not sure, don't just plug things into a tool or a process. Go ask the person. Find out. The more we can communicate, the better our result is going to be. Next, working software over comprehensive documentation. How many people here have heard that Agile means no documentation, no requirements? We're Agile. We just talk to the users, and then we build something, and it works. <laughs> Not so much. But what it means is the, the years of these giant cross-reference index 4,000 kilotree papers are over. We need to find the appropriate level of documentation. Because guess what? The teams that we're going to be turning our solutions over to in the future is going to be the millennials and the post-millennials. And guess what? They don't memorize anything. They don't have to, but boy, are they good at searching. They are wizards at searching and finding information. But if you don't have a knowledge base, what are they going to base their decisions on? They're just going to make it up as they go, call it Agile or whatever the next Agile replacement is, and have the same troubles we are. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Again, this is a mindset difference. Instead of change controlling your stakeholders to death, instead you're saying, hey, stakeholder, I understand you want something different. Help me understand it, and then I'm going to explain what the impact is, and let's make a decision. So to use an example here, and I experienced this this morning coming from the airport, Boston traffic is lovely, wonderful. I got to slowly observe the beautiful countryside or retaining walls as we went along. If I pop that into my, I use Waze, um, whatever your GPS is, you pop in your destination. 
and it's going to take you 45 minutes. But all of a sudden, there's an accident up ahead, and it's now going to take you an hour and 15 minutes. But luckily, our GPS says, I can reroute you, and it'll only take 50 minutes total drive time. How many people stick to the original plan and follow and go and get stuck behind the accident just because that's what they intended to do in the first place? How many people? OK, we got one. It's good to admit, first step of recovery is admitting we have a problem. <laughs> Almost all of us are going to take that alternate path. But why don't we do that in IT projects? We need to be able to respond to change, respond to opportunities, embrace it, and not just follow our plans. One of the worst examples of this, um, we're helping an international construction and technology company transform into to Agile. And we had some of the teams in our pilot program present how they were doing Scrum at that particular time, Scrum or Kanban. And one of the project managers was so proud. She's like, I've got this. This is amazing. And she showed this huge physical Kanban board where it had every single teammate, every step of the process, and a post-it note for every task or activity they were supposed to complete. And she said, what I do is, in the stand-up every day, I ask every person, did you finish the task? And if they didn't finish it on time, I mark it as a blocker. If they did, I move it to the next step, and I update to make sure it's working. I was like, so you literally took a complex Microsoft project schedule, put it on a board, and called that Kanban? No, that's not the same thing. So the key here is, when I first start off, and when teams first start off with Agile, typically they're just trying to reduce some of these things in the blue area. This is where we're focused. So I'm doing Agile. But it isn't until I fully embrace the green arrow and increase the amount of time and effort and focus in the green arrow that I'm actually being Agile. And that is the hardest transition. Half of the teams that we see struggling with Agile were coming in because they've been doing Agile and it's not working and we kick off a whole new pilot program to, do, to actually be agile with them and understand the cultural changes and work with the leadership to actually say, your leadership doesn't know how to manage. We heard that earlier. If your leadership is managing monolithic annual planning waterfall type arrangements, agile struggles a little bit. But there's four key areas where agile really does help us out. First, collaboration. It ends up getting our teams to work together like we should have. And 80% of project success is our ability to communicate and work together. It gives us smaller iterations, which means it gives us smaller time boxes or smaller groups to be able to respond to change. Because we have self-managing teams and we have retrospectives, we're looking at improving the process. So we're not just doing the same thing over and over again or blindly following a process. We're actually trying to improve it. And because I've got smaller iterations, I've got more opportunities to change my prioritization. Okay? Now, Agile isn't a, a cure-all for everything. So there's a few things that, we ex that some stakeholders expect Agile to solve that just doesn't. First, if you've got development or delivery or some sort of constraint or communication issues, Agile isn't going to fix it by itself. You have to fix the underlying problems in your organization for it to work. Next, we already said this, that it doesn't require documentation. It requires the proper level of documentation. And yes, you may have stories, but stories are not requirements. I still need to do requirements. And I'm not going to finish those requirements any faster. Analysis is going to take as long as it takes. So we need to build that into the schedule. We need to build that into our sprints. We need to build that into our operations. So don't let your organizations get trapped by these three myths. OK. Now, MVPs, minimum viable products. Hear about them. We want to do them. They're core to Agile. But how do they work? Who can tell me what an MVP is? Minimum viable OK, minimum viable product. Tell, um, what would that be? So if I'm a new stakeholder or a new team, and I don't understand, I don't know what that means, what is it? Well, in our organization, we don't agree, so I probably can't answer that. <laughs> OK. Okay, so it's the minimum, it's the minimum delivery that meets a business goal or objective or outcome. Okay. Does it have to be end customer facing? Does it have to actually achieve a line of business goal? Yes. 
I heard a yes. I heard a no. Could it be for internal pilot? Could I have an MVP that was an internal pilot before we release it? Sure. Microsoft switched to that. They were so tired of being mocked and ridiculed for horrible software that now their software goes through an internal test for six months. It used to be six months. I'm not sure if it still is. Uh, before they would release it to the public. Does it have to be fully functional and usable? I see some shaking heads. I could have a learning milestone. I could simply have an MVP that told me which direction I wanted to go. And so now we're falling into that executive trap of trying to do everything at once. I want to build a car. And a car has a wheel, so we need wheels, so let's hold them together with a frame. But we don't want just a frame because that would look like not even a Flintstones car. What we really want to do is, is build a chassis. So let's build a chassis, then we'll put them together, then we'll fill out the engine and the rest of the car. And it's not until I get to the car that I understand whether or not that's the car I really wanted from the beginning. And that's what our big problem is. We no longer have the opportunity to wait nine months, a year, two years to see if it's the car we want to drive. We need to rephrase what the question is. This isn't building a car. This is solving a transportation problem. So what's my skateboard? What is something that will get me a little bit faster and to see what it will work and learn. And I need a little more control, so let's add a handlebar and get a scooter. And then I need to carry a little more weight or go faster. What does the bicycle look like? But I don't really want to pedal anymore, so let's put a motor on it. What's the motorcycle look like? And finally, I get down to the car at the end, just like before. And even if I deliver the car at the same time for the same budget, I end up getting a better car, because look at all the lessons I've learned along the way. Look at all the value I've potentially delivered. Look at everything that I may be able to draw from that particular area. We can actually plot this to a line. Imagine that in our hypothetical project world, every unit of work gave us a unit of value. Every dollar I spend, I get a, some sort of dollar value from that. The steeper the line, the more value I get. The lower the line, the more work I have to put in to get a value. So ideally, there's a linear line if I could get 100% return on my investment. But when we look at waterfall, what ends up happening is we put in all this time up front and over and over and over again. But it's not until we start actually building the solution and then testing and verifying it that we actually know whether or not it's going to work. And it isn't until I finally deliver that car that I actually hit my value line and I have something that is ready to ship that I can actually test and use and know I want it. Now in reality, we really can't change the shape of that line. There's always going to be some sort of upfront work. We're not going to know what we have and whether it has value until we start testing it. And we won't have anything ready until it officially ships, internally or not. But if I simply reduce my time cycle into more iterations, I have smaller loops and I hit that line more often. And the distance, the difference in between the red line and the blue line is my value gain. Simply from deliver, not changing anything I'm doing, just reducing my scope and delivering in more iterations. This is the secret magic in action that is reported. And each time I hit that line, that is my minimum viable product. Whether I call that or not, these are the steps along the way solving the problem with the car. And maybe we're not a value-based organization. Maybe we are highly regulated and we only think in terms of fear and regulation and fines. Well, the same thing is true there. As we're going through a project and we're building up risk, we're accumulating risk, not only the time and the effort that's going into the project and we don't even know if it's what we want, but every hour I spend working on that project, I'm not spending an hour doing something else. So we have an opportunity cost between one solution and another by choosing which one to go to. And again, I can't change the shape of the cycle. But if I create smaller iterations, I can dissipate that risk more frequently and reduce my overall organizational risk, which is the difference between these two areas. And again, this is mapping to our MVP. These are the steps. These are the releases along the way. Questions or, or comments on that? Because I kind of knew these things all along, that you know, iterations were always better. It goes back to Rupp. 
Ralph always said, do things in iterations, and here's what the cycles look like. But until I looked at the actual cycle pattern and where effort comes in, that was the first time I realized that it's just doing the same thing on a smaller scale, and I'm getting this massive return on investment. This is just like investing a little bit of money when we're young, and it grows, it compound interest grows over time. This is the exact same principle, or similar principle. So the fourth thing is, we have got to stop contract negotiating our way out of change. We need to embrace change. We need to welcome it. We need to think of it as our GPS, finding a better way to our solution. Because when we look at our organizations, our organizations are built with all of these different processes and controls and policies and regulations and paperwork and all of this stuff to provide stability to the company, to keep us out of trouble. But all of these things that stop bad things from happening also stop good things from happening. It's the same brick wall either way. So we need to find champions. We need to find support to get through, get around these hindrances. Because one thing we know is change is inevitable. 64% of IT professionals adopt Agile to enhance and change their priorities. So we're pulling Agile's one of the principal ways we're saying we need to respond to change, and Agile's being thrown at it as a solution. And 71% actually felt that their ability to manage priorities and change improved after Agile. Now we know from a front end that seems to be true, but our delivery on the back end might not be there. So the other part we need to do is we need to come up with a foundation where change and innovation can take root. So the first thing is we need to give our teams and work with our stakeholders to find more of, a re find more of an environment where it's okay to explore. It's okay to try things out. We're not, in, not locked into delivering specific features, rather we're trying to solve certain problems. We need to shift our culture away from having features or having releases at a certain time for a certain cost, and instead, what could we get now? It might, maybe could we get 50% of the value for 5% of the investment? What could we do now instead of waiting for later? We need to start thinking about good failures. And actually, I'm going to challenge this one further, because we hear fail fast, uh, fail safe. And is it a failure? If we have learned something, if we have learned what not to do, is it a failure? If we deliver something that only has part of the intended value, is it a failure? It's not all the success. It's not all the value. But it's not a failure. The only failure I see in IT would be malicious intent or apathy. If we don't do anything, to me, that's a failure. But if we're doing something, has anyone here not worked for the best interests of their company and their coworkers? Does anyone here want your projects and your company to fail? If so, don't raise your hand. <laughs> so assume goodwill. Assume that all of your teams are trying to do what they think is a good idea, what they think will add value. So we're all trying to do the right thing. We just need to help them figure out what the right thing is. Next, we need to find better ways of getting these test cycles, these prototypes, into production. So our skateboard, our scooter, our bicycle, how do we find ways of getting these in front of users so that we can test and validate? Because one of the worst ways we can prioritize changes is the stakeholder or the product owner who just knows that's what it is. If they're not collecting data, if they're not looking at it critically, it's our job to challenge them. Because then they're just guessing, and maybe their guesses are right, maybe they aren't, but there's very few people who have a very good track record of guessing what the market will have, want, and even they fail. Next. We need to start transitioning from a project-centric focus to a product lifecycle mentality. So there's some big things we need to change here. The first one is, in a project world, I fund project. I fund a team to complete a certain series of features, a certain amount of work. In a product world, we're funding teams. We're funding a group that's going to change and evolve and help that product along. Next, in a project world, I assign work, I assign people to work, 
in a product world, we assign work to teams. We know what we're trying to accomplish, and we're wanting the team to chip away or accomplish that work. And by empowering them, they figure out how to achieve that value. In a project world, it's the business owner, the stakeholder, who prioritizes the work. In a product world, it's the same thing, but with, con with IT's consultation. And in a DevOps world, IT and operations feeding into that one backlog that we're managing from. In a project world, project managers are managing capacity. You need more work, we just add more people. In a product world, it's similar, but it's up to the team to decide if they want to add more people or not. When I was at the bank, we had an audit remediation project for databases. There were some database issues that had to be resolved by a certain date or we would miss our SOX compliance. As we moved along in the project, there came a point in time when the team looked at the work and looked at the deadline and they didn't match. I said, okay, what do you want to do? Like, we have to finish. Do we add more people? Do you want to add more people? And we came up with a couple, two options. We could add more people, we could pull a little bit of time from some of the regular DBA crowd, but they were way too busy anyway, so that wouldn't be reliable. Or the team could pick up the extra slack and get done on time by working overtime, working weekends. But it was the team's decision. The team had to buy in. I couldn't assign and say, you're going to work 20 hours of overtime and give up every other weekend and assume that the work's going to get done. Most of them would quit. But we struck a deal. We approved the overtime, uh, 60 hours with approval for anything over that. And if they completed on time, they got a one week paid vacation, including contractors, because most of these were contractors. So if they were going to give up all their weekends, I would pay them as a contractor for an entire week so they could take a week off at the end of the project. And what they decided was it would take away too much time getting people trained up and getting them access. They didn't think they could finish, and they would end up having to put in all the extra time anyway, plus the new people. They decided to put in the extra effort. And it was six horrible weeks for them. But they committed. They got the work done. They got the work done even a couple days early, took an extended vacation, and we were able to certify SOX. And that was about empowering the team and letting them decide and commit and own that decision. Finally, in a project world, it's the project that is defining changes to a product. In a product world, we are looking at it as product maturity. We're improving and enhancing a product or a product line or a service line instead of just adding features to it. And when we look at this as a continuum, I start to shift my focus and think of a product as what, what do we want to mature? Where is it going? What is it going to do? And the way I get that work done is through a series of product releases. I have to release. I have to push out MVPs and see how they work to know where I'm going. I can still have a project life cycle in a product world. I could still use projects as the source of funding to create product releases. But the biggest difference here is I'm looking at it over an extended period of time, and I'm looking at it as a way of maturing the product for the end users and for the value we're trying to accomplish. And another big mistake we continue to make is thinking that backlogs are roadmaps. So when I've got our backlog, I've got our current features, our current stories, and I probably have a lot of detail I've got them prioritized. And the further down into my backlog, the higher level, the more vague those items get because it's just not worth defining, spending a lot of time defining them if I don't know that's what we're going to build or not. But a roadmap actually sets the releases, the features, the goals, the epics that I hope to accomplish over a period of time. And the more I know about a product, or the, the longer that timeline might be able to go. So if I'm dealing with a product family roadmap, I may be able to stretch that out for a long time, but in a very low level of detail, except for those next few items. If I'm in an area, maybe we're developing a new app or a new service and we don't know it's going to work, there's no reason to plan a roadmap out past three or six months if I don't even know if it's going to work. So the more stable our product gets, 
the more we're just in enhance or in maintenance mode, the longer my roadmap is going to be. These, this roadmap dictates and helps me align my individual backlog items. These are the discrete pieces of work that will allow those roadmap items to be completed. But I've got to do both as a product owner or a product manager to be successful. So, in the wide world of heresy, a hybrid approach is often best. Pure Agile has trouble. There are many instances, especially during transition, where we may want to go with a hybrid methodology like Water Agile Fall or Water Scrum Fall. Now, a lot of people call it Agile Fail or Water Scrum or Scrummy Scrummy Foam Fall, whatever you want to call it. What we're really looking at is waterfall with some sort of agile methodology in the middle. We start off with more of a linear analysis and design. Maybe I'm figuring out my high level features, my constraints, my candidate architectures. Then I want to shift into agile development. So I'm actually going to use an agile methodology and I'm going to follow time box sprints. But at some point, I have to do integration testing. I have to release to other teams. They have to work together. Maybe I have a schedule, release schedule mandated by whatever my compliance program is, so I have to fit into that schedule. So really, where Scrum or Kanban fits in best is really in that middle section. If you're doing RFP or fixed-based work, this is golden because I have to do all my analysis and design up front because I'm fixed bidding a project. I gotta figure out what I promised to deliver. I can iterate and figure out some of the details and those next lower levels of detail using an iterative agile methodology. But then I have to hand it back over to our client or to another team to then go ahead and implement. And when we're looking at agile, really, you know, mostly we're talking about Scrum versus Kanban in terms of two different approaches. If you are delivering a larger set of features at a known release period, Scrum typically works the best because it's designed to break it into smaller chunks, have scheduled releases, and push those out. If your type of work is mainly by a ticketing system, you have requests and tickets, and you move those through a series of steps, Kanban is typically more efficient. So when you're looking at production support, operations, Kanban is awesome. Infrastructure as a service, service requests, all of these things. Kanban is typically more effective than Scrum because then you're getting the pushing the work out as soon as it comes through and as soon as it's ready. So there's a few times where we really don't want to use Agile or we think it might not work. First, if you don't have stakeholders that are accountable or have authority, you don't have a team structure. You don't have somebody who can prioritize the work. So if you have decisions by committee, Agile is going to be very difficult. Next. If you're already in flight in waterfall or have something that really has to follow some sort of a waterfall schedule, perhaps a hybrid would work, but jumping straight in is gonna be very difficult. If all your stakeholders have to agree at the beginning and that's what you have to deliver, that goes against the principles of Agile and Scrum, so again, not a great choice. If it's a one-off project, not a good fit. If you think about it, the whole purpose of Agile and a product focus is to look at a product and the maturity and to continue to enhance it over time. If I'm doing a one-off conversion, why would I try and build that as a product in maturity? I'm gonna do it, it's gonna have a start and an end. Whatever method I do, just get it over with. And finally, if it's really high risk, high sensitivity, very critical, or mission critical systems, you may want to go hybrid or waterfall to make sure that everything works. You can still use Scrum doing massive system replacements, but your iteration should be taking every business process and remapping them to the future. So your iterations are going unit and line by line to map current processes into the new system and ensuring that they're gonna work. But you can't, like putting in a new account system, you don't put it in piecemeal. You cut over on the last of the month, or the beginning of the, next month or in a quarter or a fiscal year, and that's your one shot to go. So it, ha it can't follow a, well, we're done on Thursday, we're gonna go ahead and push the code out and wreck all of our accounting. Okay, so DevOps. 
DevOps is not automation and software monitoring. This is the biggest jump off the cliff moment that I'm seeing and, and we're seeing recently. Is people say DevOps is about automatic code, uh, automatic compiling, source code scanning, security scanning, automated builds, automated pushing. All these little tools and all these automations, people are saying we're DevOps because we're pushing stuff out. If you have broken people and broken processes and you automate them, you will be pushing out defects at an alarming rate. And that's the problem. What we're really talking about is we're talking about getting development and operations, release, production support, operations, all working together with a seamless handoff. And first, we just need to get the two groups working. Then we get a little bit in our Venn overlap where we have participation and we're getting demand and coordination from both groups. And eventually, whether it's a physical or virtual team, we should have one distinct unit that is from development and intake all the way through operations as one virtual or physical team doing this work. So we really need to look at this as a holistic process by bringing those teams in. Because there's really three types of product owners we need to deal with in the DevOps world. We still have our line of business product owners, the ones who have that end user focus. But we have a technical product owner or a technical product owner perspective. What are the, who owns the application? Who owns the platform? What's the technical debt that needs to get prioritized in the backlog? And then what's the operational product owner? Who are the, what are the operational needs? The tools that will enhance your operational capabilities. The automation will take away some of those routine tasks. Because when we think about uh, operations, operations is truly all those things that we do that we haven't been able to automate yet or can't automate. It's all those manual processes or decisions that we can't automate or choose not to at this point. Eventually, more and more of these things are going to be automated through AI, through other tools, and our operating teams can focus on higher value decisions or things that we can't do through machine learning, AI, or just don't want to do, because sometimes it is just better talking to a person, individuals and interactions again. So there's three key successes to DevOps we want to consider. First is collaboration. So the same thing we were talking about in Agile, we're now going to take from development and push it back into release, testing, and support and operations. We want to bridge that gap and get those stakeholders participating as part of our delivery teams. Next, communication. We've got to improve our communication, our teamwork. Co clearly communicate and merge all of our demand into one backlog understand the downstream impacts. When we were, uh, there was a group who was trying to increase the speed of delivery for changes to a call center. And they were doing previously releases every three months and they thought we can get it down to once a month so that they won't have to wait for all these bug fixes or enhancements and eventually maybe every two weeks is what they thought. The call center management staff said, we will hit you if you do that. <laughs> it takes us six weeks every time you release a change to pull people off the phones for long enough to get the training, to certify on it, and to get comfortable with the new system before we, they can switch over to it. Do you know the damage you would do if we had changes every two weeks or even every month? They only wanted changes every three months because there was a training and operational impact that the delivery teams didn't know. Pushing out code, pushing out enhancements, it sounds like a good idea, but they didn't understand the downstream impact. And the final one is integration. Because when we have our people and our processes working well, and our systems integrated, it is easier for us to push changes out with lower risk. And that's ultimately what we're, gonna, what we're looking for. So how does this look like if we were to put this on a continuum? When we're all starting off, we end up using either ad hoc changes or waterfall because we want predictability. Our whole goal is to say, when are these features going to be available to us? That's what we're trying to push out. But then I start to focus and say, well, wait a minute. I don't want to wait two years for these features 
Maybe I could break this up into iterative, and if I do that, maybe I can get those features earlier. And that's when we move into an iterative methodology or at least a phased approach to deliver those features sooner. But then my agile mindset comes in and says, we're not going to worry about delivering features. We want to deliver value. Don't worry about what feature it's going to be. Did I meet the value? Did I release something that gives you the value you were looking for? So Agile shifts the focus to ROI and the value of the changes we're pushing out. Next, as my teams are working well and we're pushing value out, I have an opportunity to improve those processes, improve people, and lean is a fantastic way of doing that. Reduce time and process, reduce waste. Our retrospectives are designed to do this if we focus on it. How can I make it so my teams are more efficient? Next, eventually as I've leaned and I've got my people and processes really just humming, then I have an opportunity for automation. Then I can do automated builds, automated releases, automated code scanning. Whatever I decide to do, I can now look for tools that will take away some of those manual processes and make them automated, or at least faster and easier. Ultimately, our goal is to create a completely product-centric delivery organization where we're all on the same team trying to enhance the product and the people, processes, and tools that support the value that that product delivers to your customers or to your end users. Now, this isn't implied to mean that this is linear. And I'm not going to look at lean and efficiency until I get fully functional agile or that I can't start focusing on product. Well, the minute I switch to Agile, I start taking a product mentality. But when I hit these levels of maturity, it isn't until the end when I've pulled all of these together that I truly have a product-centric organization. So let's take a look back to our Super 7 lessons. First, the depth of the organizational divide. We've got to stop thinking about this as business versus IT. We have got to integrate. Agile provides guidance to integrating to the business. DevOps provides a structure to integrate into operations and support, even if those operational teams are within lines of business. Ultimately, if you only take one thing away, these are all about culture. This is all about how the teams work together. You're going to focus most of your effort, focus it on understanding what your culture, what are your constraints, what are the enablers? What are your blockers? That's where you want to focus your effort. We took a look at why MVPs work. By simply shortening the cycle, I not only deliver value sooner, but I also reduce risk. I have the same curve, but I'm doing it more often, which means I have less risk or less time invested before I get the value or dissipate that risk. We want to create a culture that embraces change, that welcomes it that treats it like our phone, giving us better GPS coordinates and getting us around the bad issues. Use that analogy if it helps. We want to get around these log jams and be able to respond to change. We need to stop thinking about projects and we need to start thinking about products and product maturity. This is going to have to go from the bottom up because we all have our silos and our areas and the way things work and ultimately it has to come from the top down as well because you can't push projects to deliver features and establish a wholesome product centric environment. And whatever you do with product, product and service are the same. The foundations, the value, the what it takes to be successful are the same whether it's a product or service. Whether you're a service owner or a service manager or a product owner or a product manager, the foundations are the same. Don't be afraid to stick with a hybrid approach. You know, pure Scrum, maybe a scaled Agile might work. You can use a scaled Agile framework in parts of your business without having it everywhere. Some of the biggest mistakes we're seeing is people trying to implement a scaled Agile framework, or uh, yeah, scaled Agile, not by name, across the entire organization. Literally seeing people in accounting being told how to follow a ag uh, scaled Agile framework for delivering their work. It just doesn't fit. But they need to be aware of it so they know where their demand, where their backlogs are feeding into. And then the final one is 
DevOps isn't about tools, it isn't about monitoring, it isn't about predictive analysis in your software environment or your infrastructure. It's about getting all of the people together from delivery all the way through support and operations, feeding into the same work, same backlog, with very clear and fluid handoffs between the different groups. And when I have that, then I can look at the tools to automate some of those tasks. So what I want to do is we've got, uh, we've got a little bit of time here. I want to ask, these were seven things that I found or wish I would have known or really understood a decade ago. It would have helped me not hate Agile so much because I didn't hate Agile, I hated Vagile. Bad <laughs> Agile really annoyed me. Just like I hate SAFE and a lot of the scale frameworks now because people are absolutely abusing them. So what are some things that you pulled away from these lessons that you'd like to think about or implement? Or is there another lesson that you've learned that maybe should be up here in addition instead? What's something that you all learned? Yes? Uh, this is actually um, creating the question. And I apologize if this is really stupid. It's uh, not. In, in a DevOps mindset, would you consider all users to be stakeholders? Depending on how your organization defines stakeholders, yes. So one of the first things we always do when we're working with groups is understand their culture and their terminology. So users are stakeholders because they are the ones consuming the product, so they have value. Do they get to make decisions? No. So users don't have any authority. They can only influence without authority. They can ask, they can whine, they can scream. So from a true stakeholder standpoint, not really, because the stakeholders are the individuals who make or influence decisions, either because they have enough clout that you have, kind of have to follow them, or they have authority and you have to follow their input. So I would not generally call users as stakeholders, but uh, having users as a input to your decisions, to your KPIs, to your assessments, absolutely. I think they're probably one of your biggest potential partners. So thank you so much for asking a question. Uh, thank you. Contribution <laughs> is rewarded, as the people in the front row discovered a little earlier. <laughs> Who else wants to share? Yes. So I think for me one of the key takeaways is rethinking how we define MVPs, because I've always thought about like the car and how Begin with right, was it begin with the end in mind. So yep. if, if we think the final solution is a car, then let's start building pieces of the car. But it's the way you described it was let's come up with quicker, simpler, cheaper ways of solving the problem, not right, not decomposing the final. So your your car could be your epic or your theme. It could be what you think it's going to look like. But what we need to do is is Flip the script. We're not talking about what the car is going to look like. We're talking about why we need the car and what the car will help us accomplish. And there's a phenomenal book, uh, Switch, by Dan and Chip Heath. It is the best book I've ever read on, on change management and how to get difficult change made. And what they do is they recommend creating a destination postcard. If we were completely successful in this last step, how would we know? What would we look like? It's based on a principle called outcomes-based therapy that was developed by psychotherapists who realized if you envisioned what success would look like, it was easier to figure out the critical steps needed to get there. So if I can kind of define what this postcard looks like, what success might look like, I can then define the critical steps that have to happen before I get to that car or whatever it happens to be. It could be a minivan, I hope not. But maybe we have soccer people in here, so that's a popular one. Yeah, I think, um, and I don't know if this is taking that analogy in, in the wrong direction, but if you do it a second way, yep. ultimately your final step could look different than it does in the first step. It, it almost absolutely will. Yeah. It'll be similar. The intent and the outcome will be there. The difference is, remember how we said for, there's a between what we thought this car would cost and the reality of actually having the car we wanted is a difference of 400%.
we have a better chance of getting there at the 100% mark, or we may decide we never even want it. We never even need it. And that's, that's, that's a key difference, absolutely. Yes? When you're talking about um, you know, thinking about the end in mind, and you're talking about you know, the picture of what success looks like, yep. is there a, uh, is there a um, guideline as to what level of detail you should stop at? Like, yes. Is, is leather interior a sign of success? Is, is satellite radio a sign of success? Absolutely. And I'm going to give you the most definitively vague answer possible. <laughs> it's just like your documentation. What is the level of detail you need to ensure that you hit that destination postcard? If you have an organization and stakeholders who need to know it's going to be leather versus cloth versus, well, we'll say faux leather because maybe we're conscious that way. If, if we need to get to that level of detail, absolutely. Let's go ahead and, and do that. Yes? I don't have any suggestions, but I more have a question. Yes. I'm dealing with a project with two different vendors, both do agile differently. <laughs> yes. One has three weeks scrums, one has two weeks yeah. scrums. One follows agile to the T, the other does quasi agile. Yep. Any recommendations as the project manager who needs to integrate the Fantastic, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't include this. When you look at project management in Agile, we're not looking at task management anymore. We're managing at key milestones. So what are the key milestones? What are the key compliance? What are those key high, um, handoffs that I have? And focus on that higher level. Don't worry about how they're making the soup, but make sure that when you're ready to taste the soup, the soup is ready to be tasted. When it's ready to be served, it's ready to be served. And the health inspector looked for, looked for any dead rats that were in the soup, didn't find any, we can serve it in good faith. So what, what you really want to do is shift to that higher level on the key milestones, key compliance, key areas, and let the, let, empower the team. They, they're accountable for solving that. So we've hit, uh, we've got two minutes left, and what I want to do is go ahead and close out so if anyone wants to get a refreshment before the next room, I really appreciate everyone coming here.